We didn't get you one, eh? Yeah, yeah. Here you go. Here. All right. Yeah, so uh, I'm here to go talk about uh, that annoying perennial topic, full RBF, and uh, there we go. That, uh, in fact, you know, full, full, full RBF, I mean, this has been around for a while. I think, looking back at the records, I started talking about this stuff uh, about 10 years ago now, so it's been a while, but uh, I guess to go start off, maybe you'll get a show of hands. Who here actually runs a node? All right, so I've got an audience of people who might, be, uh, might want to listen to this. So uh, let's go start off with what's transaction replacement? And, you know, to go recap, if you're uh, not clear on how all this works, remember that when you send a transaction in Bitcoin, it starts off at your computer, your phone, whatever, and somehow has to get to miners. And the way Bitcoin works is we have something called a mempool. Every node has their own mempool. And that's a set of transactions that it knows about that are not in a block yet. And the way this works is you know, when I go send a transaction from my wallet to your node, your node chooses whether or not to accept that transaction. And if it does, it then tells its peers about the transaction. And eventually, it propagates so that every, approximately speaking, everyone has a copy of that transaction. There's some nuance here, but that's basically how it works. And a notable thing about this is remember, anytime anyone talks about the mempool, they're really abusing terminology. There is no the mempool. There is your mempool. There's someone else's mempool. Collectively, kind of wave your hands and say, you know, there's the mempool, but there really isn't. Bitcoin isn't a centralized system. So, transaction replacement. Well, let's suppose you send a transaction. Until it gets into a block, sometimes you might want to replace that transaction with a different transaction. You know, why might you want to do this? Well. Here's a screenshot that you probably can't read at all from, uh, uh, I think it's Blue Wallet, if I remember correctly, showing its transaction replacement screen. And, you know, there's two options in Blue Wallet. One is bump the fee and one is cancel the transaction. Well, there's two reasons why you might want to replace the transaction. It's not getting mined. The fee is kind of low, so you want us to resend it with a higher fee. Another reason why is, well, you sent it to the wrong person to begin with, so you want to go replace it with a transaction that sends all the money back to you. You know, you might also want to take a transaction and add outputs to it. You know, maybe you're doing something like an exchange where you have a whole lot of outputs that you need to create and, you know, I send money to you and then I realize 10 minutes later, oh, hang on, I need to also send money to him. Well, with transaction replacements, it can be more efficient to replace one transaction with another, paying multiple people. And, you know, transaction replacement has actually been around a really long time. Like this is code from, I believe I got it out of like version 0 0.1, yeah, there's like 0 0.1.4 or something, or, you know, long story short is, you know, this is code Satoshi wrote way back when. And when Bitcoin shipped, you know, version 0 0.1.0, it had something called in sequence replacement. And you don't need to know the details if you're not interested, but you know, in sequence is a field and transactions, uh, inputs and 32 bits, and Satoshi's idea, well, why don't we just replace one transaction with another if the sequence is higher? Seems like a simple idea. In fact, there was some, apparently some talk by Satoshi of maybe implementing like payment channels with this, where like you keep on resending transactions. And it kind of seems kind of clever, but there is a problem with this, is, you know, this is newer stuff. Well. N sequence is like 32 bits. That's like 4 billion. So with that original code, there's nothing in here saying, you know, maybe we should like put a rate limiter on it. You know, maybe we shouldn't just allow you to replace over and over again. Because, you know, 100, like, what is it now? About 150 bytes, 200 bytes times, you know, 4 billion is enough data to go overwhelm the network with replacements. It just doesn't make sense. You know, it's kind of, it would make sense in a, you know, rate limited uh, centralized system, but in Bitcoin, it's not going to work. So this end sequence stuff got removed pretty quickly, and it got replaced by a, a much better scheme called replace by fee. And replace by fee, the rule boils down to this. More money is better. And by more money, we mean, well, what is a mining fee a transaction pays? Now, there's a bit of complexity here, and I'll touch on it later, but basically is, well, if you see a transaction that spends the same inputs as the previous one, but pays a higher fee, 
well, replace the transaction you already have with a new one. And it's not just Bitcoin that implements this. So my understanding is Ethereum has a, basically the same thing for its unconfirmed transactions, and it, it works quite well. Um, replace by fee, if it's enabled, you can go resend your transaction, pay a higher fee, get in. Economically, it makes sense. Miners are always earning more money. Now, again, there's caveats for kind of edge cases here, but the, the basics of it make sense. So what's, what's the catch? Why, why am I even giving a talk on this? Surely this was solved, you know, 10 years ago. Well, but when the end sequence rule was removed, we were left with something called sort of a by default rule called the, what some people call the first seen rule. And if you don't have some mechanism for replacing transactions, essentially your node keeps whatever transaction it saw first. And if you're running a mining node, well, that means you will mine the transaction you see first. And you know, in the early days when we thought we'd be like buying coffee with uh, Bitcoin on chain, a lot of people thought this was a great idea because, well, Obviously, if I'm going to, you know, accept coffee on chain, I mean, if I, you know, if miners only accept the transaction they see first, surely I can just send the money and I'm done. I don't actually have to wait for confirmation. You know, and there's a lot of people who really like this idea, but the unfortunate reality is, in practice, it's not that reliable. And there's a lot of reasons why it's not reliable. I mean, one reason, for instance, being in the situation we see right now, mempools are overflowing. What do we mean by overflowing? Well, quite literally, your mempool on your node has a limit for how many megabytes worth of data it's allowed to go use. If this was unlimited, many nodes would just run out, would run out of RAM and they'd crash. So obviously there has to be a limit somewhere. And the way that limit is implemented is by throwing away the lowest fee transactions when a new transaction comes in that would bump you over the limit. Well, what does that mean in practice? If I go send you money with a low fee, even without transaction replacement, there's a reasonable chance that at some point it will just get kicked out of the mempool and then I can send another transaction with a higher fee. And since mempools don't have consensus, since you know, they're just nodes having transactions, in practice it means I can go double spend that unconfirmed transaction. There's also issues around, well, what if I send you transactions at once? You know, you might go and have a wallet, and you see one transaction, but I've simultaneously sent a different transaction with the same fee. Well, I mean, what's going to happen with all the no other nodes? If they see two transactions spending the same input with the same fee, it's not, it doesn't make sense to replace one with the other, because there's no, because again, there's no consensus over mempools, so there's no question of, well, which came first? All I know is that I saw one first, and maybe someone else saw the other, so if I play that game, I have like 50-50 chance of ripping you off by just sending two transactions at once. There's also issues around, well, what exactly are the rules? You know, Bitcoin has something called standardness rules, where we say, well, there's transactions allowed in blocks that are considered valid, but a subset of those transactions are considered standard. And what precisely those standardness rules are doesn't necessarily match between one node and the other. And it doesn't necessarily match between one miner and the other. You know, some miners have slightly different ideas of what is standard. Again, you can exploit these things to double spend unconfirmed transactions. So long story short, you know, this first scene idea is mostly a failure. And you know, as an example, in my home country of Canada, um, a couple of years back, there was an ATM provider that was accepting unconfirmed transactions as valid and immediately spitting up money. And sure enough, they got uh, defrauded to tune about $300,000 by a gang of thieves that just went around and did double spends. And, you know, and then they got caught because fortunately for them, there were cameras around and eventually the police actually did their homework and eventually found these guys. But my understanding is the money never actually got, re you know, got recovered because people actually doing the theft were you know, just middlemen. So yeah, don't accept uh, unconfirmed transactions as valid. I think we kind of should all know this, but at least back when replace by fee was implemented, this was considered enough an issue that we got a compromise, which is we had BIP 125, opt-in RBF. And this idea was to say, well, why don't we reuse this end sequence field, which otherwise at the time wasn't doing anything, and we'll say a transaction is considered to have opted in to allowing replacement 
if the end sequence field is less than some number. This is all a little convoluted, but you know, end sequence is used for um, end lock time as well, so the rules kind of have to, you know, dance around a few issues, but that was basically a compromise. Long story short, you can opt into replacement. And I think this got implemented in 2015, maybe 2016. Someone could correct me on that. And, you know, even back then, I mean, this compromise was considered not very good. And, you know, one example being, well, having this distinction between one type of transaction and another means you have privacy issues. You know, it's one more bit of information that likes a chain analysis can use to de-anonymize you. It's also complexity for wallets. In fact, we're seeing now, now that you know, mempools are full and lightning is a thing, a lot of wallets are just disabling the ability to change the setting because it's, you know, just adds confusion to users and results in transactions getting stuck. And, you know, with current mempools, transaction gets stuck. I mean, it's not really clear what you do. Do you wait for it to expire out? Well, mempools don't have consensus. So there is no such thing as expiry. It's just local. So it's, it's a real mess. But, you know, that is the compromise that we got. However, more recently, protocols that do multi-party transactions have become increasingly popular. And what do I mean by multi-party transaction? Well, classic example is coin joins. In a coin join, you create a transaction with, in the case of something like Wasabi, you know, 500 of your closest friends. And that means one transaction has multiple inputs controlled by different people. Now, if you have a Wasabi coin join with 500 other people, you can ask yourself, well, what happens if one of those other people double spends their input? And the challenge is, unless you have replacement, you can be in a situation where that, you know, one of these other people double spent their input, that transaction happens to get to miners, and it has a low fee, and now you're waiting for something to happen because all you see from your perspective is you have a coin join, it pays what seems to be a reasonable fee, yet it's not getting mined. Because the mempool is not a, the mempool, it's just an amorphous thing, you have no idea what transactions are in miners' mempools. You know, there's no way to directly connect to them. All you see is a transaction just kind of sits there and you don't know if it'll ever get mined. And full RBF fixes this really nicely because with full RBF, let's assume that you have your coin join and let's assume you wanted it to be mined in a reasonable amount of time. Well, that means you have a fee rate high enough that miners will mine it reasonably quickly. Thus, the coin join will replace the double spend. Doesn't matter that the double spend happened anymore. It'll just eventually get replaced, go away, and you're good to go. Now, conversely, in the other situation where the double spend paid a high enough fee that it wins, well, that's okay too because it must have paid a high enough fee that it will get mined quickly. Thus, you will see it in the blockchain, which is a shared consensus system. And your coin join client can say, okay, but coin join round failed. Let's go try again. And I need to point out, coin join protocols, they fail all the time. You know, if you're trying to make transactions with 500 of your closest friends, there's a good chance one of these friends will go and fail to do something. And the way modern coin join protocols work is multi-phase protocols. Because obviously, you have to get together all the people. They have to propose outputs. And then they have to come back and then propose, or sorry, propose inputs. Then they have to come back and you have to propose outputs. And these systems work these ways because you need some distinction between input and output or you don't get the privacy advantage. But since you have, you know, more than one step, inevitably some people will fail. Now, I've had the Wasabi, you know, I've talked to the Wasabi guys and apparently Right now, about 30% of Wasabi coin joins succeed, which is actually shockingly high. I mean, I, I was expecting that number to be much less, and for a while it was much less. But the important thing is that Wasabi deals with this through a punishment. You know, if you have a round that fails, they have a mechanism to identify who didn't go and you know, add their output and who didn't follow the rest of the protocol. Thus, you can blacklist those UTXOs for some amount of time to make sure that you know attackers have to spend money. Now, you need to help me with 
And that's a key thing. Attackers have to go spend money. So I'll, I'll get to this in a bit more detail later, but you know, this is why it's OK if replacement doesn't always work. And another example of multi-party protocol comes down to things like Lightning. You know, we want to go have the ability for multiple people to fund a Lightning channel. Now, obviously, if multiple people are funding a Lightning channel, just like a coin join, you can have a situation where one of those people double spends an output, and thus your Lightning channel open just kind of sits there. And with Lightning, in the, arguably, it's even worse than like something like Wasabi coin join because there's no centralized coordinator here. You know. At least in Wasabi, in theory, they could do things like to connect to you know, hundreds of nodes and try to look for double spends and all this. That's completely impractical if we're talking about you know, a decentralized wallet that's running on your phone or your laptop or something. And frankly, you know, those, I don't think those solutions are good. You know, Wasabi CoinJoin isn't the only thing out there either. There's also um, JoinMarket, which has no central coordinator, and you expect it to run on everyday systems. But... Long story short is multi-party transactions convince people because of this issue to add a mempool full RBF option. And that got merged, uh, was it, I think July 8th into Bitcoin Core and was on track to be released in the um, version 24 release. You know, I mean, if you were around there, nothing really interesting happened when that happened. No one really cared. It looked like it was on track to go. But, we had this bit of a panic, which is, uh, long story short, uh, Sue Haas um, argued that we should go remove it. And uh, his reasoning really came down to something called transaction pinning, which I'll explain in a second. And now keep in mind that this option at this point was a default off option. You had to enable it yourself to even just experiment with this. You know, this wasn't changing the default behavior at this point. But the argument here was get it removed. And let's go talk about transaction pinning. You know, wh what do we mean by this? Well, the term pinning basically means attacks to multi-party protocols that prevent transactions from being replaced. Now, didn't I just say that the rule was simple? You know, more money is good? Well, it's not that simple. You know, in practice, to implement replace by fee, you need to do something a bit more complex than just saying more money is good. You know, these are what's called the BIP125 rules, and this is the rules that Bitcoin Core implements to determine if a replacement should succeed. And of course, there's the first one, which I mentioned before, with the end sequence bit. Um, and then the rest of them are essentially a mix of things that were implemented to make the implementation less risk as well as less likely to have DOS attacks. And a simple example of this is, well, imagine if the rule was a transaction could be replaced if it paid at least one Satoshi more in fees. Now, remember what I said about then sequence, how it didn't work because you could do you know, a billion replacements? That would have the exact same problem. So one of the things that Bitcoin Core implements is a replacement has to pay at least enough money that it quote unquote pays for its bandwidth. You know, that is to send a transaction with more money than a fresh transaction would have paid in the first place. Because remember, part of what Bitcoin does to um, deal with a mempool is it figures out, well, what is the minimum fee that a transaction should have? And when, trans you know, when mempools are overflowing, that fee is based on basically, well, what is the fee rate of the transaction that we just kicked out? There's also the idea um, in BIP125 that replacement transaction has to pay at least the sum of all the other fees of the replacement. And this comes down to, well, what if you're replacing a big transaction? You know, you might have a higher fee rate, but your total fee is actually less. And then uh, rule number five really comes down to our implementation isn't very good. We say, you know, a replacement can only replace 100 transactions at once. And that comes about basically because the algorithms that actually deal with the mempool really aren't very good. And back when this was introduced, they had edge cases, and we figured, well, you know, why don't we just go and add a safety limit, if you will, and we'll deal with this later. You know, we can't calculate necessarily how much, like, a big, long string of transactions actually pays in fees, so we just come punt on this issue. And 
it turns out transaction pinning exploits exploit these rules. Um, and there's really sort of two ones that matter. One is rule number three, which is you have to go pay for at least the total amount. And then the other one is rule number five, which is the 100 limit. And rule number three is sort of an economic thing where if you allow transactions to happen purely by fee rate, you can be in situations where maybe the total amount of fees that miners could collect goes down. So that's not so easy fixable. Rule number five though is really easy to fix, which is you make better mempool code. And there's ways to do that, which are probably out of scope for this topic, but the real question is, at the moment, does full RBF make things better for multi-pair transactions? And you know, the answer is yes, because remember, we're not talking about a situation where we have to prevent transaction pinning from ever happening. It's always possible to screw up multi-party transactions. You know, in decentralized systems, you can do all kinds of things. The question is, how much money does it cost to do an attack? And you know, having to go and muck about with transaction pinning with like 100 different transactions, that costs far more money than double spending with one transaction. That's really all it comes down to. So, you know, I think Zuha has jumped the gun on this and it definitely does help with multi-party transactions. It, you know, makes these attacks much more expensive and in practice, they're not likely to go happen. Also, attacks aren't the only thing that happens. I mean, double spends happen by accident. You know, Wasabi, as an example, has had long running issues where people will go run the same Wasabi seed on multiple different computers. Well, the computers don't know what each other computer is doing, so obviously they're going to wind up double spending just by accident. You know, because one computer is participating in CoinJoin, you know, another computer or the same seed in a completely different wallet is sending money. This will, this will happen. And you just don't want to be in a situation where these kind of accidents screw up the experience for everyone. But because of the politics of this, you know, we still have these issues, but do we or do we not turn on full RBF? And another way that people have looked into is forcing replacement on. And I'll go talk about three different sort of categories of proposals. Um, now a funny one is if you spend an output that makes use of check sequence verify, because check sequence verify checks and sequence um, field, you actually turn on full RBF with BIP125 anyway, because it's impossible to spend that output without setting in sequence such that replacement is turned on. And people have actually proposed using this in certain kinds of protocols, although I don't think this is a very good solution because, you know, again, let's look, look back at the coin join example. Do you want a coin join wallet where now, you know, to deposit money into it, you have to deposit it in like multiple steps to get it into a special output? No, that's kind of silly. You know, you don't want to have, like, you want a coin joins that can operate with any output. You know, you don't want to have these kinds of weird, con you know, weird restrictions. And inherited replacement is a similar proposal um, where you, mark outputs as only spendable with replacement enabled. Um, and this kind of idea would, you know, it's again, it's a variant of the sort of check sequence verify thing. But again, you have this problem where now people trying to go and use these multi-party protocols have to do special things to their transactions. And again, it's inefficient. It has privacy problems because you're flagging your transactions in special ways. You know, I, again, I can't really see it as, as a good idea. And finally, a V3 transactions, which is yet another variant of the same idea. And uh, V3 transactions, this comes down to a proposal in service, two parts in one pull request, which is to do package replacement and package transmission, and then also have this V3 thing that changes the rules around exactly how you can spend unconfirmed outputs. Now, I'll step back for a bit. What do I mean by package transmission or package replacement? Well. Remember that Bitcoin allows you to spend an unconfirmed output in the same block. So you can have a transaction that is mined in one block, that creates an output, and is also spent in the same block. Lightning and protocols like it make, um, can make use of this in cases such as, you know, let's suppose we have a Lightning tr um, channel, and the channel gets closed, 
due to uh, forced close. Well, that forced close is a transaction spending the commitment output, but that transaction might not pay a high enough fee to get mined. So since the Lightning Protocol works by only having one, um, one transaction in that step, you can, get, you can encourage miners to mine that transaction by spending it again with a higher fee, such that through what's called child pays for parents, miners can say, hang on a second, if I mine this transaction, I can then mine this transaction, but that transaction is a high fee, thus it makes, it, makes sense to, to mine this low fee transaction. And the challenge we have in high mempool congestion environments right now is that the minimum fee to get into a mempool at all might be too small for that first transaction to get mined at all. So the idea of transaction um, packages is you think in terms of a package of transactions. And you know when my node relays a transaction to you, rather than it just looking at, I will relay one transaction, then maybe relay a different transaction, I will say, hey, here's two transactions, it's worth it for you to accept it because the second transaction makes the fee of the first transaction worthwhile. Now, the implementation of this doesn't actually work that way. It's used as something else that's a bit clever, but that's basically logically what happens. In the V3 transaction proposal says, well, all right, first of all, we should go implement this package relay stuff, which things like Lightning um, can use. And then on top of this, we'll have a new transaction version that doesn't affect the con consensus rules but does turn on replacement in the non-consensus logic. And I'll admit, I don't really like this proposal, and I don't think it's uh, a proposal that fixes a wide enough class of problems. And again, it comes back to, well, if you're just doing Wasabi CoinJoin, none of this stuff matters because you want transaction outputs that are not special to be possible to go and replace with one transaction, and the V3 stuff doesn't really, you know, doesn't really matter um, to you there, but, oh, you know, there, okay, yeah, but, you know, it's worth mentioning uh, these proposals, so, stepping back from the tech a bit, well, this means full RBF is really a political trade-off, and here's uh, good old Craig Wright um, giving one of the reasons why it's a political trade-off, because, uh, you know, Craig Wright thinks that uh, if a node allows a double spend and mines it, and remember, Craig Wright thinks that nodes are only things that are doing mining, you know, he thinks you should be able to go sue them for allowing this double spend to happen. And, you know, Craig Wright is a guy with a lot of lawyers. I'm personally being sued in two different lawsuits by him. You know, one of the political aspects of all this is, well, miners would, you know, could arguably look at this and say, hang on a second, you know, I mean, regardless of what you think about the technical advantages and disadvantages of full RBF, I don't want an environment where, because some guys want to go buy coffee on chain, I might get sued by a guy like Craig Wright, who wants to accept coffee on chain and then complains when it gets double spent. Because, you know, as a miner, I mean, my, my ability to stop a double spend with an unconfirmed transaction, I can't realistically do that. You know, I'm just one miner. I'm not coordinating with other miners. I'm not deciding what is or isn't a valid transaction. I just run a node and it accepts stuff. Sometimes it'll accept stuff that's a double spend from the perspective of one person. What do I know about that? You know, similarly, when we go talk about, you know, do we make it easy to go and buy coffee on, the, you know, on chain or do we like make things easier for multi-party protocols? Well, that's a political trade-off. There is no technical answer that can make things perfect for both of those at once. You have to do things like say, well, there's less privacy because now you have to say opt into RBF. Or there's more privacy because anything can be replaced. You know, you also decide between these people who want unconfirmed zero conf and wallet authors who might say, well, screw this. I just want a wallet that like is simple and always has replaceability enabled. You know, why would I want to give my users some weird convoluted path that 1% of the time they might use to buy that coffee on chain that could also result in transacting stuck, which will create a support call. You know, I don't want to go and be answering support calls when this stuff breaks. So, 
you know, my argument is you should to go turn it on because the people trying to go do this are a very limited number. In fact, you know, when you look at who has complained about the mempool full RBF option, it really comes down to one guy who doesn't actually have a product that makes use of any of this stuff, and then another um, company, uh, what's the name, CoinGate, if I remember correctly, or, you know, I think it was like Gap 600 or something. You've probably never heard of them because while they claim that they're involved in like 10% of all Bitcoin transactions, frankly, I don't believe them because they also claim to be involved in BSV. <laughs> and, you know, there's a whole lot of scammers around BSV, so I'm, I'm not going to go and screw up multi-party protocols for their sake. You know, they can complain all they want. But, it gets to the next question, well, all right, if you agree with me, how do we make this happen? And it's actually quite simple. You go to uh, bitcoin.conf and uh, add this flag and reset your node. Or if you have something like Umbral, you know, there's even in the GUIs uh, click boxes that will turn on full RBF. And if enough people do this, well, I can stop having talks on this discussion and stop boring you guys. In particular, if you happen to run a big mining pool, please turn this on because it'll make all these arguments go away. But at least in the mid, you know, interim, while there's, well, you know, not everyone's turned this on, there is a question of propagation. Back one, there. So, again, let's go back to how do, how do transactions propagate? Well, the question is, what n other nodes is your node connected to? And for full RBF, the worst possible case is if you're running a node that isn't accepting incoming transactions, the default is your node will connect to eight outgoing peers to relay transactions. So, if you're connected to eight outgoing peers, the question is, well, what percentage of nodes running full RBF and successfully connected to other people there need to be for a given ch um, probability that you will also get replacements? And the math on this is actually pretty simple. Um, you know, if you know a bit of statistics, you can probably work this out yourself. But effectively, you can think of, well, what is the probability of all of your peers not supporting full RBF? And as usual, go and uh, invert it. Oh, and actually, I think there's some brackets. Yeah, there's some brackets missing there, but you can probably figure out where they should be. And well, long story short is when you go and you know when you go and run this. Yeah, definitely brackets would be nice. But when you go and uh, r run this, uh, and you go work this out, effectively, if about 20% of nodes are successfully running full RBF, the probability of your no incoming connection node connecting to a peer with full RBF enabled is like, what is that? Yeah, a bit over 80%. You know, it's fairly high. And in practice, this works better than you'd expect because while, you know, many nodes, of course, aren't listening and thus just have eight transaction relaying the connections, a lot of nodes are listening and the default for a listening node is they'll accept up to 128, um, 125 connections. In guys like me who want full RBF to work, we can play games like just connect every node at once with full RBF node. In fact, I'm doing um, this with one of my no you know, one of my full RBF nodes where, you know, I run I run one of the DNS seeders which introduces new Bitcoin nodes to the network. So I have a list of well, what nodes are running what software and what their IP addresses are. And I have manually gone through, figured out all of the version 24 nodes that I can find and just manually connect to as many as I can, which currently is like, I don't know, 700 at once. So in practice, full RBF transaction propagate pretty well. In fact, I've also measured this as to what percentage of version 24 nodes seem to be both you know, have turned on full RBF and more importantly are actually relaying transactions. And my measurements basically came to the conclusion that something like 20, 30% of version 24 nodes have full RBF on and are actually connected to enough peers to relay. So that's reasonably high. Of course, t version 24 nodes aren't all of the network. So in practice, that number is less than you'd expect. But like I say, given how incoming, um, transa you know, incoming connections work, it, it works pretty well. And 
If you're, say, running a mining pool, there's also another very easy way that you can ensure that this works, which is, which is full RBF peering. And I have a tree that does this. I didn't actually write the code for it, but I've kind of kept it up to date. And all it does is it says, well, I will advertise the fact that I have full RBF enabled, and I will manually connect to four other nodes that have also advertised that fact. And long story short, if you run this code, there's a very good chance that you will be connected to other nodes and successfully propagate full RBF replacements. You know, it works very well. Not all of you need to go run this, but you know, if you're a bit more adventurous and run this, that would be great. And certainly if you're running a mining pool, that's one way to make all this stuff work. So with that, thank you. <laughs> questions? Yep, got a couple of questions here. We'll start with Jimmy. Thanks, Peter, for the talk. Um, so there, there was a paper recently that uh, talked about using RBF to sort of de-anonymize. Uh, uh, apparently, um, in addition to chain analysis, if you are running a full RBF node and you are able to detect when a transaction gets replaced, you can essentially detect which is the change address out of any sort of like uh, thing. What, what are some sort of mitigations that uh, I guess wallet providers and uh, you know people can do to sort of thwart this um, I guess heuristic that they've come so, up with. To be clear, this isn't uh, this isn't actually related to full RBF. Mm -hmm. um, what you're talking about is related to transaction replacements in general. Yes. And you know this has been an issue. I mean, I you know I probably pointed it out like 10 years ago mm -hmm. and. The answer to that is really simple, which is try to estimate your fees reasonably correctly the first try. Because if you don't need to do a replacement, well, none of that really matters. Now, obviously, you're not going to succeed every time. But you know, in, in practice, it looks like the percentage of transactions that get mined that have been replaced is on the order of like 1, maybe 2%. You know, it's actually quite low. You know, the replacement in most cases is really just there as a backstop to fee estimation. Because most transactions, they get the fee right, or at least right enough, and they don't need to be replaced. Now, that isn't always true. Um, you know, I personally run a very notable counterexample to that, which is my open timestamp servers. And the purpose of them is timestamp data. And long story short, they work by repeatedly replacing transactions over and over and over again with higher and higher fees with an updated Merkle root of all the data that needs to be timestamped. You know, in that case, RBF is just much cheaper than the alternative, and in you know those transactions are public anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But you know, certainly in general, just try to estimate your fees correctly the first try and leave replacement as a backup. So, you know, I think it's an issue, but it's just not a very important one. And full RBF isn't really relevant to that discussion anyway. You know, particularly things like the coin join case, where the times when replacement matters are things where you know a coin join has has you know either would fail anyway so i think that answers that cool got a question we got puria over there with a question thank you um I, I know you probably have uh, answered this quite um, a few times already, but like, I want you to, to expand on the political decision part, right? So you say that you know, supporting multi-party transaction is the way to go, and sometimes you have to sacrifice people who willingly want to accept zero confirmations transactions. Um, you say that it's a political decision, so I just want to know, have you considered like, um, the, the ups and downs of these decisions thoroughly? And do you see that going away, as in would it be obsolete? People would just move to Lightning or stuff like that? Well, it, you know, I mean, this has been an issue that's been floating around for easy 10 years now. I mean, quite literally, I think the term full RBF is at this point, like exactly 10, you know, approximately exactly 10 years old. So. I think you know when it, what it comes down to is you got to ask how many people actually accept unconfirmed transactions 
and will go give something of value in exchange for an unconfirmed transaction in an environment where they don't have recourse? And the answer is very, very, very few, because it's just so risky. I mean, just the other day, I was uh, selling some Bitcoin you know, that I'd gotten for it to go pay for flights that a uh, you know, conference had gone and uh, given me. And uh, you know, I happened to be selling at an in-person Bitcoin exchange. And this was in Spain, where that particular one was AML KYC. They literally had my passport. They knew exactly who I was. You know, they could easily go and come after me if I double spent them. And I'd, I'd sold at this exact same place before. And previously, they would accept unconfirmed transactions. They didn't care whether or not opt-in RBF was set. I mean, that was irrelevant. You know, it's AML KYC. They can uh, send the police after you. But that time, they wanted a confirmation. And I asked why. And it turned out, even in that use case, people double spending by accident, by sending money with a fee, you know, with low enough fee, and then their wallet just double spends it. That's caused them enough problems that they're just not willing to run that risk anymore. And you know, I told the guy obviously, well, he should accept Lightning. And you know, there was some lowly paid uh, intern who didn't really understand Bitcoin very well, but even he agreed with me. But you know, I, I, unfortunately, I think that's that's just the answer. The tech situation has moved on. Lightning works pretty well, and no one's ever figured out how to make this unconfirmed stuff work in a way that makes sense for a reasonable number of people. You know, if you or GAP 600, and if you believe them, apparently they're connecting to you know, zillions of nodes and like running sophisticated analysis to do risk scoring and all this, but it's notable that services like this apparently exist, yet very few people actually use them. And I suspect it's because they're probably mostly scams and don't actually work. You know, and sometimes you just gotta make trade-offs between things that don't really work well and things that actually do. I mean, the block size issue is that too. You know, we made a choice that we would keep the block size what it basically is, you know, SegWit, SegWit was a minor block size increase, but it can't be, um, can't be done again. And we made that choice. And had we not made that choice, maybe I could go buy coffee on chain. But we would have traded off a whole bunch of other stuff. And we chose not to. You know, and full RBF is that exact same category of choice all over again. And, you know, I choose Lightning. I mean, past, uh, you know, the past week worth of transactions I've made, I'm not even sure I've made any on-chain Bitcoin transactions. They've all been lightning. It, it works. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. We've got five more minutes of Q&A, guys. I'm sure there's tons of questions out there bouncing around in your brains, you wanting to spit in them out. Or not, I could have just explained everything already. <laughs> Going once? Oh, yeah? Yeah, we got one over here. Do you reckon there'll ever be a push for uh, mempool full RBF on by default? Or is, is that just too risky and touchy for most people to get behind? I mean, I can open a pull request tomorrow to go turn it on by default. <laughs> but, like, I, I, I think this really comes down to how much drama devs really want to go deal with. I mean, the people who have been in favor of disabling um, you know, this mempool full RBF option. I mean, there are also people who've argued that replacements in general should be disabled. You know, um, frankly, you know, bit refill, their arguments that they made about replacement um, screws them over with pricing. Because you know, I could go send bit refill a transaction at a given Bitcoin price, the Bitcoin price can change, and then I could double spend it to then try again with you know, a better price. I mean, they, they make that argument, but they accept opt-in RBF-enabled transactions. I mean, they accept Lightning, too. And, well, I can, on my Lightning client, I can delay when it actually settles, just like I can on on-chain Bitcoin transaction. I mean, these kind of issues, you, like, yeah, I can see why they're arg making this argument, but, I, yeah, they've kind of lost that argument. But as long as it's a dramatic thing, well, it's going to play out this way. And... You know, if like the path to making this less dramatic is probably a, of course, people like you go and enable full RBF, and like I said, you know, a significant percentage of version 24 nodes have turned it on, um, and b, once more mining pools enable this, I think this will go away. You know, certainly if um, say you know a big one like Antpool turned it on tomorrow, this discussion would become very pedantic and 
you know, in another couple months, I'm sure we could just turn this on by default. But currently, it appears that Luxor is the only significant pool that turns on full RBF by default, or that, you know, turns on full RBF. And then it looks like F2 pool and perhaps some other pools, I'm not really sure what they're doing because they keep on mining double spends, but they don't do it consistently. So this might be related to them, say, having low transaction expiry times, which will, you know, kick a transaction out, then can get replaced. This might be to them actually turning on full RBF on some of their nodes. Because keep in mind, you know, even a pool like Luxor with like 3% of the hashing power, they do not run one mempool. They run like a couple dozen mempools, and they all have different settings. So if a pool like F2 pool ran full RBF on, say, you know, 10% of their nodes, where they essentially would translate, say, 10% of their hashing power, you might not necessarily realize this. So, you know, maybe they're experimenting this with, maybe they're not. I mean, it's, it's really hard to know because mempools aren't reliable. But, you know, that is a path forward. So if anyone here has a bunch of hashing power, please uh, turn it on and we can all stop listening to uh, silly debates like this. Awesome. We have time for one more question and then we'll get, get on a break. I, I, so, so, uh, I want to ask you about the, um, uh, so I saw in, in, in the Twitter that uh, you proposed the uh, tail inflation for Bitcoin supply <laughs> to support the miners when the subsidies uh, goes up. So it, 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 is this correct? It, 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 is my un un understanding is correct? Yeah, so I, I, I like generating controversy apparently. So I, I've pointed out how you know, tail emission isn't actually inflationary in the long run. And the reason why it really comes down to, well, you know, tail emission says you go create a certain number of coins per block, and you do that amount forever. Monero has, has implemented this. And the issue is people lose coins, and the probability of a given, you know, Satoshi being lost is, is sort of a percentage of, um, uh, I guess what I say is like, so if you know, I've given them a value, there's a certain probability I might go lose that value. And since that probability scale, the amount of coins lost through that scales with the amount of coins actually in people's hands and actually economically relevant, long story short is those two things eventually converge and the monetary supply of economically relevant coins stays the same. So that, that can be a way to go pay miners. And you know, this is relevant because somehow we got to pay miners. Currently, we pay it with inflation. You know, a lot of people like to go, like, post on social media about you know million-dollar transactions that pay 20 cents in fees. And the answer is no, they didn't pay 20 cents in fees. They paid 20 cents for a transaction fee, but they paid who knows how much by inflation. Inflation is a tax on savings. You know, all of us are losing value for a Bitcoin due to inflation. So. That is a way to go pay miners, and you know, yes, I propose that, but since that's a hard fork, it's much more likely that we'll see this same kind of idea implemented with Demirage, which is another variant of the tax on savings, and say, well, when you spend a coin, you have to go and pay a percentage of its value times the amount of time that transaction output has been in existence, and then you send that money off to a pool of money that then all miners can collect from. You know, and economically, it's the same thing, but implementation-wise, it would be soft fork. So, you know, I could see that being implemented in the future. But keep in mind, I mean, inflation right now in Bitcoin is, I think, it's like 1.5% right now. Yeah. And it'll be like another 10 years to get down to like 0.1%. And so 0.1% is the kind of number that's low enough. Who really cares? You know, 0.1% compounded over like 75-year lifetime is like, I think, 20% or something. You know, if you can't afford to pay 20% to keep your coins safe, I mean, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> you know, like, I'm sure Bitcoin's going to rise more than 20% over 75 years. I'm sure Bitcoin might fall more than 25% over 75 years. Like, th that kind of number, it just doesn't matter. It's low enough that who cares? You might as well build this into the protocol to ensure miners get paid. Because we always want mining a block to be valuable. If that's not true, you get to weird edge cases where like there aren't a bunch of fees in the mempool and suddenly miners start like reorging blocks to get more money, which only big miners can do, and it's just a big mess. We want mining to be boring, so let's, let's make mining boring. All right, awesome. 
Great talk. Okay, so we're gonna have, let's thank go, you. Give him a round of applause, Peter.